So I'd like to introduce everybody to Jane Holton. Jane was until recently Australia's longest serving um, Commonwealth Secretary um, as a woman, um, but I think pretty much one of the longest regardless of, of gender. Um, she was the head of the Department of Health between January 2002 and June 2014, and then head of the Department of Finance from 2014 to 2016. Um, Jane's a member of the Order of Australia, um, a public service medalist, um, also an honorary professor here at the Institute for, for Governance, and more recently she is on the board of the ANZ Bank, but I prob promise not to ask you any questions about the transaction tax. That's okay. I've, <laughs> I've got my line straight. I'm happy to answer that question as well. Okay. So look, uh, Jane, welcome to this, this series of conversations that we're, that we're having on contemporary leadership in, in the Australian public service. Mm -hmm. So the first question I wanted to put to you is, can you give us some background on your career journey? Sure. So um, like a number of the people in this room, I joined the Australian Public Service when I joined as a permanent officer, as a graduate. But I had dabbled. Um, I had had a temporary part-time job at the Bureau of Statistics. <coughs> uh, immediate, the day I submitted my honours thesis, I took up this temporary part-time job. But I also was working at the ANU. And eventually I actually got a job at the ANU because I th thought I might be an academic. So I was sort of lining up to do the PhD and then I used to go to endless morning and afternoon teas in the Coombs building at the ANU where there were a lot of fossilised people. <laughs> and I looked around and I thought to myself, in 40 years do I fancy being one of them? I went, nope. So I went, I, th at that point I applied for the graduate uh, round and I became a graduate of the Australian Bureau of Statistics. And this was, a, I'll do this until I figure out what I want to do. And some 33 year, years later, it, I still hadn't figured it out, but I figured I might resign at that point. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you're a Canberrian born and bred? Then? No, 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 I'm not a Canberrian born and bred. I, um, I emigrated to Australia. You know this, don't you? Yeah, yeah, I'm trying to. Yeah, you're trying to get me to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> He's interviewing skills. Can we rate them at the end of this? Um, so basically, I emigrated to Australia uh, just before my 14th birthday. I was born in Britain. And um, I then went for a short period to Canada. This is courtesy of my father's wandering around the globe. And I think the thing you're trying to get me to say, which I will say, so when we came to Australia, we came because my father was a Commonwealth Department Secretary. So I was the only ever second generation secretary, second ever woman to become a Commonwealth Department Secretary and the only ever second generation. And my dad, when he was alive, used to say, they'll never beat us, <laughs> which is very funny. But I was very lucky with my career because I was offered a job at the end of the graduate year and it was what in those days was called a Clark Class 7, uh, which is probably, it's probably an APS 6, I guess, that was in the Bureau, but someone had offered me um, an APS 5 equivalent in the Department of Social Security in the research area of aged persons welfare. And given what I'd worked on at ANU and what I was interested in, um, because I did a degree in psychology, was older people and some of those issues around um, ageing, dementia, etc. So that's why you went into the Australian Public Service? That's right. They're all ageing, they're all demented. Um, <laughs> so, so basically, I, I moved to Social Security. This guy said to me, you know what, you can always come back. Go and try in the policy world. So I did. And eventually, um, I got to work on really interesting things negotiating hospital agreements. I learnt how to work with state governments. I negotiated bilateral agreements with the states. And then I went to finance as uh, what was called then a Clark Class 11. Who knows what a Clark Class 11 was? A director. Yeah. So an EL2 in com common parlance. We keep changing the labels. And so I went to the Department of Finance to learn how the centre of government worked, which was very interesting. And then I went back as a band one to the Department of Health and um, had a second child while I was doing that. I had my first child in finance. My oldest child is nearly 28. It's 28 in September. So I did one budget wearing a very loud red dress with having a very large bump because in those days budgets were in August. And Bob Hawke used to stab his cigar out 
when my baby would come into the room followed by me. In those days, people smoked in the workplace, which was disgusting. And so eventually I, I got promoted. I then ran the aged care program, which was fantastic. In fact, I've just had a meeting today with someone about what's going on in aged care. And then I went to the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet as a Deputy Secretary. <coughs> From there, where I became slightly notorious, I eventually became the Secretary of the Department of Health where I survived for 12 and a half years and had a ball, had a lovely time. It was wonderful, it was a very difficult job. And then went to the Department of Finance. So where I had been um, very, very many years before and there were still people there <laughs> who I'd worked with, which was great. Hi Jane, remember us? Yeah, it was good. <laughs> so I was very fortunate that I had very nearly 15 years as a Commonwealth Secretary and on anyone's measure that's quite a long time. Um, the Industry Department Secretary, Glenis, is a very, very good friend of mine. She's a very good woman. So let's go back a little bit. So, yeah. so in a sense, you were, you were, you were joining the family business in, in some ways. Mm -hmm. So what, what were me meal times like around the uh, Sunday lunch at the, at the Holtons? At the Holtons. So, my, so it's important to understand the journey, actually, because my father started his life um, as a mathematician. He had, uh, my mother had an honours degree in mathematics and my father had a master's in mathematics and he started an industry. So he didn't join public sector when he graduated. And when he figured out he wanted to join the public sector, for reasons I won't bore you, but to do with class and opportunity in England, uh, he found it difficult. So that's one of the reasons we left. And so he joined the public sector later. Now I've joined the public sector early and I've now left and I'm now doing things in, in business. So if he were alive, he would enjoy this quite enormously. The sort of, the, you know, the Coles to Newcastle reversal that's going on here. But my father was one of those people, and I've often said, you know, he, he was a very um, inquiring mind, a very uh, seriously thoughtful, intellectual person. And he was very tough when my kids were small because there was just no fun play button with my dad. But as soon as they got to a point where they could hold a conversation, and I was once asked whether Max Moore Wilton, who was then the secretary of the Department of um, uh, Prime Minister and Cabinet when I worked there, he was known as Max the Axe. Have any of you ever heard of him? I was asked whether he was scary and I said compared to my father he was a piece of cake. But he was, I mean the thing about that tutelage, it wasn't all about what was going on in the public sector, it was just what was going on in life and the world. So was that sort of style of leadership um, a, a product of its time? Would, th would that style of leadership still work today? I think um, the world is a much more complex place than it was and I think we also understand much more um, about how to lead groups of people. And in his day, although he wasn't completely a command control person, but in those days command control was very much what you saw. Now interestingly, when I joined the public sector, I could not have told you what the secretary of my department looked like. And had, didn't have a clue. Now, understand if you will, there was no such thing as email in those days. What a blessing. Um, which meant you didn't get emails from the secretary with the banner across the top with a photograph plastered firmly in the right or the left hand corner. Um, so you would know uh, in our world whether you just walked into the lift with the secretary. Well, if you were alive, you knew. Whereas in those days, you didn't know. You didn't know. And so the approach to leadership, the way you actually had to lead because of technology and a whole series of other things, was by d definition different. Whereas these days, you know, generations of people who are much more connected um, electronically in terms of communication, they have expectations about their rights and having a say and all those other things. So the world is different. People's expectations of a workplace are different. So you need to be more adaptive. You need to be more adaptive, but I also think you actually need a, probably a broader range of skills. Mm. I mean, we talk these days a lot more about emotional intelligence. Mm. Uh, and I don't think that it's necessarily that those things are particularly gendered. But I do think you have to think very carefully about all of those things when you're leading a group of people. Particularly, um, if you think about this, here's a group of people, we could all basically physically touch each other. We could have bilateral conversations with each person in this room. We could get to know each other. When you're leading large groups of people, you cannot physically put your hand on everybody every day. So you have to find a different range of skills. 
And you also have to think about how you influence the people you can see and touch on a day-by-day -day basis and what skills you're giving them to communicate as well. Mm. Okay. Well, well, we'll come to talk about those skills in more detail a little bit later on. Um, but could you identify some of the sort of key sort of life cycle challenges that, that you need to confront during your career and, and how you navigated them? By life cycle you mean? Well, it could be having kids, it could be getting your first big promotion, it could be managing your first high-risk project, um, you know, those, those sorts of things. Okay. So there's enough women in this room and actually it's relevant to the guys as well. So let's talk about parenting. Um, I had my first child when I was 29 and that was in the Department of Finance. And the fi Department of Finance is pretty legendary for in budget season just basically going at it very hard. And so I had to both navigate um, in a department where there was no woman in the SES at that point. So I was a section head, L2. We were the most senior people in the department. So there wasn't just the how you navigated being a woman with a child in the workplace. There was the precursor, which is how you navigated being a pregnant woman in a workplace. And that was not actually easy. Um, I don't know whether any of the people in this room have children. There was a lot of people coming up and patting my stomach. <laughs> I mean, apart from the appalling uh, you know, invasion of personal space, you know, I could go on. And sadly, I think that sort of thing happens today. So the first part of that process was actually discovering that people treated you differently just because you'd done this and learning how to manage, you know, you have an image of yourself as a kind of competent professional contributor on issues and all of a sudden people are calling you mother and patting your stomach. Mm -hmm. So that, that was a, a journey of itself. And then of course once I had um, my first child and then my second child, working out how to navigate leading a group of people, because I was, um, discharging my obligations and the responsibilities I had as a parent, managing that in the context of family life, all of that um, required me to kind of reset a couple of buttons. Um, famously, I have a fairly high work ethic <laughs> and I had to basically decide how I was going to manage uh, making the contributions I needed to make into the various parts of my life in a way that didn't necessarily compromise any of them. And you have to consciously think about that. Mm -hmm. You really do. And the guys do too. So when I say it's not just for the women in the room that I say that, one of the things in finance when we talked about what it was that actually would enable women to get promoted, uh, one of the really clear uh, conversations we had was enabling men to take responsibility when it came to parenting as well. Mm. So did it help being married to a public servant that you were able to work these things out together? Look, I don't think it matters what your spouse does, to be perfectly honest. I mean, if there's a, um, there's a set of logistical arrangements you need to put in place, mm. you need to be clear about respective expectations. Mm. You need to be clear about what the role responsibilities you're going to take. And then sometimes you both have to be flexible because the best laid plan falls apart for some perfectly explainable but not predictable reason. Mm. You know, you end up in the middle of some cabinet level conversation when you're on pickup duty. I did have Senate committees trained so well that all I had to do was, and someone would say, do you have to pick up a child? <laughs> and one of the things that I always did, because um, I was very conscious, particularly as I became more senior with, with children, that there weren't many role models of women who actually showed that you could balance family and work. And so my oldest child met his first prime minister when he was six weeks old. <laughs> He was in a, you know, those car carry cop <coughs> things on a desk in the Prime Minister's office. They'd rung and said, would you mind coming and talk to us about this particular problem, something I've been dealing with in the workplace. And Paul Keating walked in and said, well, who's this? <laughs> so that's one of our favourite family stories that my older son Morgan met his first Prime Minister. They've met several others since then, but, you know, the first meeting was at six weeks of age. And so my children if I was caring for them and I had a, a need to do something in a work sense, they came. 
So if they were rating the prime ministers that they've met... Oh, I, could, I couldn't possibly <laughs> disclose that. It would be breaching their privacy. <laughs> OK. Um, so, so obviously that was, that's basically about thinking seriously about how you, how, how you navigate these issues and how you develop networks of, 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 of support. Um, you said earlier that you developed a reputation for a, a notorious reputation. Um, what, what do you mean by that? So, I mean, when I was in Prime Minister and Cabinet, um, I became involved in something known as the Children Overboard Scandal. And so I was the chair of the People Smuggling Task Force. And when you're not very well known, and all of a sudden you burst into uh, public view, courtesy of something that is controversial, um, and you're different, you're a woman and you're young, and it was the, who the hell is that? And so that meant that I came into the public focus in a way that was not always particularly comfortable. Um, and of course, I had to do a whole Senate inquiry when I had just taken on the role as the Secretary of the Department of Health. So that was a double burden. Um, now, if you work on the basis that there's no such thing as bad publicity, <laughs> you know, I did have very high recognition factor in my department when I arrived. They all knew who I was, which was good. Um, but you, you have to learn how to deal with those things. The, the more senior you are in the public service, the more likely it is at some point you will do something in your professional uh, life which someone somewhere doesn't like. And that means you can be vulnerable to crit criticism and you have to learn how to manage that. Do you think you were well prepared for that? I mean, did you have adequate sort of... Is it something that you can get training for? Is it just learning through doing... Um, do, I mean, strategic communication is becoming increasingly more... Totally. Uh, ...important. So I, so I do think the thing about learning how to communicate is part of the armoury you have when you end up in those situations. Mm. I think, however, one of the most important things you can do to prepare yourself is be absolutely clear in your own mind what your job is, how what you do relates to the code of conduct, how it re relates to, to the legislation. So if you think about it, if you sign on as a public servant, you are actually signing on to a code, a whole series of behaviours, and responsibilities that come with that. So if you know, and if you think about people who have been involved in the Pink Bat scandal and all these other sorts of things, the thing I always had did throughout my career was tether back, whenever we were in difficult circumstances, what I was doing in relation to those touchstones. So, and I've also said a lot, I'm actually quite good at separating the personal from the professional because otherwise I think you could go mad. And we all know these days that work follows you uh, around with the mobile phone. You know, there's no such thing as off. Mm -hmm. uh, people expect you to be on 24-7. So there has to be a point where you can switch your head from one mode to the other. Mm -hmm. I am now not director, graduate, secretary, whatever you might be. Um, I am now me the person, I'm out going for a run with my friends, I'm out having a drink with friends, I'm, you know, vacuuming the house, whatever it might be. So being very clear about how you've done what you've done, why you've done what you've done and how it connects back to those, those touchstones, I actually think is quite important. Mm. But it does imply a certain level of competence in what it is to be a public servant. One of our major concerns on, on this program is um, managing change processes. Yep. Um, and of course, when you joined the Department of Health, that was a, a super department mm. with quite embedded norms and values. Absolutely. So how do you embark on a, on a change process, especially in an organisation that large and that complex? Mm. Well, the same is, is true of finance, of course, and we did mm. a big change program in finance. I think you're aware of that. So, I mean, the first thing is actually to understand the place as it is. If you think about any journey you go on, you go from a specified place to an anticipated destination. If you don't understand the specified place where you are now, with all that that brings, the geography, the emotional, the psychological, the norms, yeah, everything to do with how we do what we do and who we are, 
unless you actually understand that, you cannot set off on the journey, in my view, because you don't know where people think they are and where they think they're going. So you have to really have a good understanding of that. And I also think you need to create a shared agenda around change. Now, what, I mean, it's a very long time since I actually first went to the Department of Health. But let me talk a little bit about finance, because mm -hmm. that's a quite recent journey. And <coughs> when, I, when I got to the Department of Finance, and I've already said, I was greeted by a, hi, remember us, which was lovely. There were a lot of people there who had been there a long time. That's a strength that's also a weakness. And one of the challenges for finance, um, and how many of you have had anything to do with finance? Your time will come. So one of the challenges with finance, finance has a responsibility, not only to deliver the budget, which I'm sure everyone's aware of, but it also has a responsibility to lead on public sector change. And if you're going to lead on public sector change, how credible is it if you haven't changed yourself? Focus group? Answer not very, right? So one of the early conversations was, how do we think we're going? What is the change agenda we should be leading in the public sector? And have we done this to ourselves yet? So we started to work on what the change agenda might be. And we did a huge amount of work with staff, like huge amount. And it was also looking at um, what other organisations had done. Because at the end of the day, nothing's usually that original. Um, what was going on in Westpac? What was going on in the Commonwealth Bank? What was going on in some of the big consulting firms? What as an agency we, we like? What was the nature of our business? Could we draw parallels with consulting firms? And the answer is actually we could. So if there are lessons we can learn from people who look a bit like us, what are they? And we spent a lot of time with people from all levels in the department going and ferreting about and thinking about that. Which meant that when we came to set an agenda, we were setting an agenda that was defined by leadership, yes, but it actually understood who we were and where we were and the kind of place we wanted to go. So we actually engaged the staff. Now, one of the first things we agreed was um, that physical location was going to make a big change in terms of how we'd be able to affect that journey. And how many of you know where the um, John Gorton building is? Yeah, so that big old building opposite the National um, Gallery? Very old, and we weren't only in that building, we were in seven buildings in Canberra, let alone all everywhere else. So when you're trying to build, <coughs> and what we decided we needed to build was a networked, agile workplace. So you've got a building that is very constrained by its floor plate, by very old fit out, and with people scattered everywhere. So to physically walk from one building to the next, you could spend two and a half hours a day. So what was my immediate priority? Moving out of that building. And to give you an example, which I mean, it sounds so trivial, but actually it's quite tangible in my mind. And we found someone to take over our tenancy, which was good. It was people who were in the other end of the building. So they were happy, we were happy, everyone was happy. We found a great building, um, which was cheaper, Senator, um, than the tenancies we were in. And what we did was we actually set up all of the floor plates so they were completely standard, which means you can move from one area of that department to another by just taking your side unit. And it, everything looks the same, new technology, and somebody I know who was very senior in the business world came into our foyer to see me and came upstairs and said, Jane, I cannot believe what I've just experienced. And I said, what's that? Now, this is someone who'd been to the Department of Finance many, many times over the years. And this person said to me, there's noise and there's energy. There's noise and there's energy. And I thought, excellent. That's what I want. So all of a sudden, and people would tell stories about, you know what, I've just met so-and-so in that division. That person's never spoken to me in 10 years. So all of a sudden, the new way of working, the physical location, all of that was about changing how people worked. It was great. What about, um, did you have the ability to recruit particular people into particular areas of, of the department or was it 
about doing reculturing with with the people you already had in there well you know look at the end of the day you could basically replace absolutely everybody one you'd lose all of your corporate knowledge mm -hmm. and two um, you're still gonna have to build the culture you want mm. are they gonna come all these new people you are gonna bring in are they gonna know how to do these cutting-edge things no they're not so basically I mean like every department there's change people move in people move out mm. there's some people who actually need it for their own career reasons to broaden and actually in a number of cases we have developed much more uh, active arrangements working with people on their careers and then we brought some people in but basically this was the Department of Finance doing this to themselves mm. and learning how to work in a much more projectized approach so really exciting and we didn't get everything right you know the reality is um, we used to say um, fail fast and fix it yeah, try something new that one didn't work junk it let's move on there was no problem with saying that didn't work you didn't have to keep committed to something just because you thought it was a good idea now as it happened most most of it was reasonable it actually worked quite well mm. but the stuff that didn't work we just got rid of it mm. Mm. so how do you manage the the political relationships when you're going through that sort of major process of internal reculturing so I mean political relationships for departments are always quite challenging as we know and the thing about that is firstly ministers needed to understand that's what we were doing so for example I mean the days we were actually physically moving everybody everyone had to understand we were busy and when we changed change, change the IT excuse me <coughs> people had to know that the IT was going to be offline etc but we also had to work with ministerial teams etc to have them understand what we were trying to deliver and why we were trying to do that and get them to work, try and work with us in a different way as well. Because very often, if your customer keeps pushing you back into the box you were in, it makes it harder to affect the change. And as we said to them, we are gonna get some stuff wrong, but we'll try not to dis, you know, inconvenience you in that process, which we didn't, I don't think. So um, coming to sort of the pointy end um, of sort of um, the study and practice of contemporary leadership, mm -hmm. um, First question here, do you think gen gender makes a difference in terms of leadership? Um, as in, are girls better? As in any perspective you've, you, 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 you've, you've got on the issue? <laughs> well, of course girls are better. I think, I think every person brings a set of skills, strengths and weaknesses to leadership. And there's all sorts of stereotypes about what women are better at, what men are better at. My view is you need to think about what the package is that's required to lead and then say to yourself, what am I good at and what am I not good at? I've said on many occasions that the first thing I think you always have to think about leadership is about not putting someone else's mask on. If you put someone else's mask on, people will see straight through you. They'll see you as a phony. Mm. Because if you're not true to yourself, and if you can't be open and honest with people, people will spot that. And the, one of the most important things is authenticity in leadership. Mm. Because people will want to work with somebody. They will be prepared to follow somebody if they think it's authentic. So. I actually prefer not to think about gendered leadership. I mean, I think there are lots of issues about gender, um, which I've talked about in the public in the past. But from a leadership perspective, I'd like to think that everyone can think about the skills, the repertoire, and practicing things in a leadership sense, and understanding where they might be stronger and where they, where they might be weaker. Well, that's actually in keeping with the, the, the research in this area as well. I quote from a, um, a study that was conducted by Professor Deborah Rode at Stanford University, I quote, an overview of more than a hundred studies involving evaluations of leaders indicates that women are rated lower when they adopt masculine authoritative styles. So that, that issue of authenticity is, is clearly crucial. Now, w when we conducted our, our work on, on women in leadership, a number of key um, assumptions were made by um, quite a number of, of senior men, men in the Australian Public Service. Yeah. So I'm going to run a few of these through you and see, and see what you think. 
the first one was uh, women lack, lack ambition for leadership. Mm. Do, do you think that's true? Do you think women do lack ambition for leadership? No, but I do think um, women sometimes set higher hurdles for themselves before they're prepared to put themselves forward. Mm -hmm. uh, again, I've said this many times, but I'll repeat, repeat it. I have seen time and time and time again as I've gone through recruitment processes, and I actually then found a strategy to, to deal with this, which I'll tell, talk to you about. There were seven competencies for a job. The women all go, I've got seven, you know, I'm not super confident about them, so no, I'm not, I won't put my hand up. The guys will go, I've got one nailed, I'll wing the rest. And it's true. Uh, and I have seen that on interview, I don't know how many times. Mm. And so I do think there is something, firstly, about people who are trying to bring women on in the workplace, understanding that can be the psychology. Mm. Um, and <coughs> there are ways of dealing with it. I used to bring women in um, and I'd say to them, oh, look, I'd just like you to act in that job for a while. Is that all right? Sarah, will be sorry. You know, you, you'll be fine. Oh. And of course, knowing full well that if you'd said, just apply for that job, mm. they'd say, oh, I couldn't possibly. So once they've done the job for six months, excellent, now we're going to advertise. You can apply, can't you? Oh, can I? Yes, you can. You've been doing it perfectly competently for six months. Off you go. So, you know, there's, you, but you have to know that about people's headsets. Um, it's a particular uh, point of pride for me that health was over 50% women in the senior executive service when I left. Mm -hmm. And uh, finance was 48%. And Partly that was me figuring out, because you don't always understand this stuff when you first become a, you know, a secretary, that there's just a point where you just do it. It's the old Nike thing, just do it. And I figured out by the time I got to finance, I just had to do it. And so basically just got these women into those roles. Mm. And the thing about that then is once you've got the 40, 40, 20, um, 40 men, 40 women, 20, I don't care. I don't think 30% is enough to change the conversation. But in my experience in workplaces, if you've got at least 40% of whichever gender, and I don't think all female workplaces are any good either, just for the record, I really don't like them. I think uh, a mix of people in a workplace leads to a more, what I would describe, normal conversation and less back chat, you know, less side conversations. So, so patronage and support for women is, is clearly key. I think so. Um, I do. So what prevents male leaders from extending the same sort of patronage to, to women colleagues than they would do to, to male colleagues? So to start with, I have seen um, male leaders do this, and mm. so it is perfectly plausible and people can. I sometimes think that the male leaders they talk a big game, you know, um, they think, and sometimes I think is they don't have the repertoire. Um, sometimes I think they're paying lip service. And sometimes um, they actually are worried what others will think if they go out pretty hard on this issue. And so what they, you sometimes see people doing is, oh, well, we're going to run a course on um, gender bias or we're going to uh, unconscious bias mm -hmm. and that'll be my contribution and then once I've done that it'll all fix itself. Mm -hmm. Well in my experience it doesn't fix itself. Mm -hmm. It's not like a mould that will just kind of grow its way to cover the issue eventually. You, you're not going to get infected. Mm -hmm. um, you actually have to do some things of mm -hmm. real substance and once you have changed it I think it can be self-perpetuating. Mm -hmm. You know once you've got female role models they're there. When I joined, so, there weren't many. Yeah, so, so, so you think that the foundations are there now with the increase in the number of women departmental secretaries? I think, that, I think it makes a huge difference. I don't know, let's ask the women in the room. Does it make a difference seeing women at the top? Yes. Yep, there you go, focus group. I, I, look, I do think it makes a difference. But it, at the same time, it remains an ongoing challenge because we've yes. had better numbers previously, <laughs> as you know. I know. So it, it seems to me that it's something that where you have to sustain the momentum. You can't be complacent. And they've seen that in the business community as well. Mm. So the business community, um, women on boards got to a certain number and then just sat there. Mm. And until someone said, you know what, we're going to actually start having targets. And mm. if you don't deal with it into targets, we're going to go to quotas. Mm. 
So there is a point where mandating or the threat of a mandate, I think, does make a difference. So you think targets are a good idea then? I do. And would that not just be in relation to gender, would that be in relation to other diversity groups yeah. as well? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay, so another, um, another um, quote from um, a senior um, male member of the APS. To be successful, women have to choose between careers and having children. <laughs> Clearly you are a living embodiment of... <laughs> of that not being true. Absolutely. Um, and the, the final one, women don't have necessary leadership qualities. Oh dear. So um, I suppose the, the interesting response from a lot of men that we surveyed as yeah. well was that they didn't buy into this male-female qualities of leadership argument. They're, in fact, a number of them said, well, I, I don't exhibit those male qualities of leadership, you know? So there was kind of a presumption that um, if you don't join the boys club, right, if you after work you go back, look after the kids or, or, or do whatever, um, that you were equally as excluded. So a lot of men were saying, we don't share that um, sort of dichotomous view of, of leadership qualities that women can, um, can exhibit both masculine and feminized yep. qualities yep. of leadership. Yep. Would, would, would that be your view? I think there are men around who understand that leadership is quite a complex thing mm. and there are differences between individuals. I do think there are still men around who show what I would describe as a pretty stereotypical of that kind of more masculine mm. uh, approach. And I do think that the, the exclusive club problem is still a problem. Uh, when I did my valedictory speech, I sort of... I didn't go straight up the middle on this, which some people were surprised about. I kind of went round it a bit. But I made the point about um, whether or not it was okay that there were still kind of exclusive conversations, the in-group and the out-group. And, and I think this applies to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. I think it applies to people with disability, people, you know, I could go on. Um, and this is my point about having a, a workplace that is diverse which actually breaks down the propensity to have exclusive, selective conversations. The in-group who, you know, they go to the pub together, they, you know, they do things, or, I mean, not even that, the, in the workplace, they're having a conversation that doesn't include others. Mm. And it is that we are special conversation, mm. which is denoted by a group of people with particularly defined attributes, mm. which I think is the pernicious problem. Um, if it's a gender-driven thing, you know, it, it could be a conversation about you know, which is exclusive in relation to race or whatever. I don't like any of those things because I think that actually, uh, apart from the fact that it shows shocking leadership, uh, it also doesn't enable in the workplace you to do the best work. I mean, you know the evidence. Um, diversity in decision-making, the people who make decisions, leads to better decision-making. Mm. So if you have a narrowly defined group of people who control decision making and if they are all of the same type, whatever that is, mm. you are not going to get the same strength in decision making. Mm. Mm. Simple. So look, I'm going to ask you a final question and then I'm going to open it up to the questions um, from around the table. My question is really about uh, how do you find uh, Jane time? How, how do you cope <coughs> under such pressure? Mm. Uh, you know, what do you do to, to remain sane when you're experiencing that type of pressure in, in the workplace? I mean, I'm pretty um, well known for having quite good boundaries, um, recognising that some days work is just 24-7 and that's all it is. But for me, um, continuing my interests, my personal pursuits has always been part of that. Um, I'm an exerciser, so for me, I'll get up in the morning and go for a run. Um, I have been known to go for a run on about three hours sleep, which isn't always very safe, mm -hmm. but just to clear my head. Um, and I've always been a great su supporter of the notion that physical activity and physical fitness actually helps your mental acuity, mm -hmm. uh, not to, mean, to mention it actually helps you deal with stress. Mm -hmm. So um, in our case as a family also, and particularly when my kids were little, uh, we were a big skiing family. So, you know, I would take my kids on the weekend and sometimes, you know, 
my husband would take them because I was busy or he was busy and I'd take them or we would both take them and then I'd end up on the phone the whole time. You know, you know what it's like. Mm -hmm. But I think actually having something which is a complete distraction um, and you know, the truth of the matter is standing at the very to uh, top of a very steep ski slope, it's very hard to think about work. You know, it's kind of, I can get down that slope and not kill myself or I can think about work and kill myself. <laughs> hey, I know what I'm going to do. Well, maybe they're very similar things in terms of... Well, wiggling, that's true, yeah. <laughs> Dodging and weaving, that's very yeah. true. That's very true. Okay, thanks, Jane. Can I, can I open up some questions? Being able to deliver frank and fearless advice is absolutely fundamental to what it is to have an apolitical, independent, expert public service. But one of the things you have to understand is that you need advice to be heard. So finding ways to communicate to people to deliver that frank and fearless advice is actually one of the incredibly important art forms of the public sector. There's a whole bunch of science and then there's a bunch of art. And this is where we're in the art space, right? And I used to describe it to graduates coming into um, finance and, and health as understanding, for example, when it comes to different political parties being in government, you had one lot who speaks Greek and you have another lot who speaks Italian or Swahili or something else. Um, so you have to be able to seamlessly swap from Greek to Italian. And if you speak Greek to the Italian speakers, they won't like it and it's not, and, and then you will not actually be heard. So finding how you have a voice how to actually deliver a message, which sometimes isn't a message they want to hear, is actually one of the art forms. One of the things I was most proud of when I announced I was going to resign, it's time to do something else with my life. Um, a couple of journalists actually got quotes from people on both sides of politics. And the thing I really liked about the quotes was on both sides of politics, they said, the thing we valued most was Jane always told us what she thought. Now. Many people will tell you um, that you can't tell people directly and if you tell them the wrong way, I can understand why you might think that. I have never met a minister or a POSIC who, if you say to them, you know what, you're about to tip off a cliff and it's not going to be pretty when you hit the bottom. But you've got to find a way to get their attention, to make them understand that you actually do you are doing your job by telling them this. That's how you give frank and fearless advice. You know, it's not rolling in the door and saying you're, you're, you're a bloody idiot, you should do that. And it doesn't work like that. That's not frank and fearless advice. So, but yes, I mean, I, I do have a reputation for being quite direct. Um, now, when I first get minister, used to get ministers, I possibly wasn't quite as between the eyes, but that's about delivering, delivering advice in the context the better I knew somebody, um, I talked before about all I had to do was this with my watch. Um, I remember sitting with one minister one day and we were talking about something and a stakeholder group was in the room. I didn't say a word, not a word. And stakeholder group left and the minister said, so you hated that, why? <laughs> and I said, I'm clearly a terrible, terrible poker player. And this minister said, no, I just, I just know you now well enough to know that that silence meant something. Tell me what you thought was wrong with that idea because I thought it was a good idea. I said, all right, well, let me tell you why I didn't like it. Here, here, here and here. Oh, I didn't think of that. So that's someone who's then eliciting the advice. But that was, a, that was quite a mature relationship. Oh, you know what? So this is very funny because someone asked me exactly this, conversa yeah. this question the other day. And you know what I said in answer to this? I said, I don't know that I would tell myself something because one of the things, but I'll tell you why. Um, one of the things that I decided very, very early on in my life, um, but I took it into my career, was when I made a decision to do something, I was always really clear about why I was doing it. Now, that meant sometimes I would make mistakes and I'd get things wrong. <coughs> and, you know, we all have sometimes regrets. But I always knew why I'd done it. So I think it's actually quite hard to give myself advice, you know, retrospectively. But the piece of advice I would give you is always know why you're doing something. You know, just be clear in your own head. Because, you know, sometimes you come to forks in the road or decision points or choices 
um, even with how you deliver a piece of work, why did you do that? Why are you making that decision? What is it that's led you there? And if you know that, if you're wrong, learn the lesson, but don't regret. Now, some, well, probably the piece of advice I give, would give myself is sometimes listen to my own advice more. Because <laughs> occasionally I'd go, oh, I wish I'd done that. But you know, that's life, isn't it? I always like to keep why there are so many advisors in perspective. And it's to do with a review that was done a good number of years ago now into the structure of the public service, and particularly the senior ranks of the public service. And it was a point at which government were very unhappy with how they were being serviced by the public service. And they didn't feel they had enough capacity to respond to political issues and that the public service didn't understand that, which is true because we don't always understand. And any public servant who tells you that they get politics, meh, I'm not so convinced. Good public servants, it's a rare good public servant who is a really good political operative. I'm not saying it doesn't happen occasionally, but it's pretty rare. So there was quite a, long, a strong push at that point to create a more American style of leadership, i.e. every time the government changed, the senior levels got swept out and you brought in your own people. And the wise heads who were part of those conversations at the time did not think that our style of democracy would suit that. And so the compromise was to create the senior executive service, a more highly skilled cadre of leaders, and at the same time have advisors, more advisors in offices to do some of that political work. Now, as advisor numbers um, grew, but also as the complexity of what happened in the modern world and in government grew, what you've seen is advisors who basically will end up with areas of responsibility for a minister, which they, means they then interact with departments. And some advisors um, get it in terms of what their role is, i.e. they are not the minister. And some advisors, don't get it. And it's one of the challenges because very often people who come into advisor roles, you know, they've been party members or they, you know, they were the president of the Liberal Club at the local university and they've got a job in, you know, as an electorate officer and, you know, on you go, or they were a unionist and they're being groomed for a political career. So they have sometimes zero experience of what it is to deal with a public sector and what the ground rules are. And so, given half a chance, they will intrude into places that they shouldn't be. So, and I have read over however many years lots of criticism and lots of nasty language that's used about advisors, you know, calling them the children and all this sort of stuff, which I actually think is unfair and doesn't understand what their role is. But one of the challenges for the public sector, and this is where senior leadership is incredibly important, is to be very clear with ministers and sometimes with chiefs of staff what the boundaries are. So to give you an example, um, I have heard of stories in the past where advisors would ring up and say, I don't like this brief. You are to take it back and you are to change it to say X, Y and Z and to recommend Z. It doesn't happen uncommonly. So the right answer to that is, is there a material error in the advice that's been given? Because we wouldn't want that, would we? No. Right. Well, actually, no, I'm not changing my advice. So learning how to work, and of course, invariably, when those sort of circumstances, the departments I ran, you know, the people in my place always knew that was straight phone call straight to me because that was overstepping the boundary, and then I'd, there'd be a phone call to the chief of staff like that. So we don't play like that. Don't work like that. But sometimes these are people who don't understand that. So you don't necessarily shoot people in the first five minutes. You have to have a process, exactly as we were talking about before with ministers, you have to have a process of education, you have to have a process of people getting to know each other, you have to have a pr process of people respecting what each party has to do and understanding a little about their jobs. But you know, it's like everything, sometimes there are people who are rude and objectionable, and that's in the public service, and sometimes there are people who are rude and objectionable in offices. 
everyone makes mistakes. So. So, so when you get somebody like Arthur Sanadinas, who's played all of these <coughs> yeah, different roles, yeah. uh, does that show in, 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 mm. in his, mm. his approach as a politician? Completely. Mm. Completely. Absolutely. He's been everything. He's been an economist and the treasurer, he's been a staffer, and now he's a politician. Mm. I could tell you, but I wouldn't, because I'd have to shoot you all which role I think he did best, but there yeah. you go. So aged care is very close to my heart. Um, I, I've reformed aged care several times <laughs> in my career and I literally was talking to someone about aged care at lunchtime today, so there you go. Um, someone from the sector who wanted a little bit of, this is the you know, gratuitous advice freely given part of my current world. Do you mind talking to us? No, not a problem. Um, I mean, the, the, the challenge for, with aged care, as you would understand well, is to make sure it's high quality um, it's appropriate to people's needs and it's affordable. And as we all get older, we know that people's needs firstly are changing, so people's expectations about what kind of care they'll receive. People usually want to stay at home if they humanly can. But we also know that there are some people um, who will actually need congregate care, and particularly people who are cognitively impaired, which is a nice way of saying dementia, just to be clear. And, and so the challenge we've got from a policy perspective, is how do we deliver you know, what our citizens actually deserve in that space um, without breaking the bank, because it's very expensive, and how do we also deliver it in a way that actually makes sure that the quality is high, and that's where the workforce stuff is so important, as you would know so well. Um, getting nurses into aged care, as you know, getting, uh, getting doctors to go and visit aged care homes, you'd remember that stuff, it's a real challenge. Um, now, I have to say, I'm now completely conflicted in this. I have a mother who's in a, an aged care home. She's in a, um, she's high care and she has dementia. And so I now walk into aged care homes. I mean, I've been walking into aged care homes for more years than we will even discuss, because it's rather a long time. And I, I still walk in to that service with one eye as the daughter and one eye as the person who used to be the regulator <laughs> and the policy maker. So, so our challenge is to think about how we build workforce capability, we ensure the model that we deliver is what people want and need, and we do it at a, in, a, um, in an affordable way. But you know, the standard of aged care these days is much better than it was. And I the remember the aged care standard is dying. Yeah, do you remember? Get people getting a free That's right. To be able to be That's right. Before then it was anybody. Anybody. Was Unemployed, see ya. Uh, unemployed painters and decorators. Uh, no, yeah. thanks. Yeah. That's true. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, and how's industry? Good. Good? Really good. Excellent. You know, it is true that I am the organisation Nazi. Um, I wouldn't say it's down to 10 minutes, but I have been known to give my husband the five minute warning on occasion, like when we went out to dinner last night, I said, five minute warning. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I, I am very organized. I mean, one of the things I knew, particularly when I was having children, that I would not be the kind of person who could stay at home and do anything other than be a, an absolute monster as a mother. I just knew that that was not for me. Now it's for some people, that's fine. It was not for me. And that meant I knew that I was going to have to um, be really meticulous about how I manage what I do and all the rest of it. it. It's not impossible. And the challenge is to be able to deal with the curveball when it gets thrown. You know, you've got all these neat little plans and when someone gets in the middle of them and basically makes a mess, um, not to just, ha you know, have the entire world fall apart, just to kind of go, right, adapt. This is how we're going to do it, but yeah. Um, look, I'm a bit of a lists person. Um, I had the most fabulous uh, assistant for 17 years in the public service. So she, her name is Rana, and she was awarded the Public Service Medal um, in the Australia Day Honours, which I was absolutely delighted about. I was determined she was going to get the Public Service Medal for putting up with me for 17 years. Um, br brilliant leader, actually, of EAs in the public service. I'm really proud of her. And so she had the job of managing my hideous diary. These days I manage my own diary. I did say to her recently that I've discovered that the hardest job I'm now doing is hers because <laughs> I'm managing my own time. 
essentially I would always know what I had to achieve in a particular time frame. So I always had a rule um, when it came to the paperwork. If I touched it, move it. So never pick up a piece of paper, read it and go, oh, I don't know what to do with that, put it down again. Never do that. Once you've touched it, move it. Even if it's to send it away and say, I'm not sure about this or I feel uneasy or come and talk to me, move it. Um, and so never, never be holding other people up. And just know what you had to achieve by when. So, and even now, that's what I'm doing. So I've got a list of things. In fact, I'm going, um, I've got a bank board meeting this week, but I've still got a list of things I've got to achieve during the week and I've got a little yellow sticky note which I'm crossing stuff off. So I don't pr program it down to the five minutes, you know, and between 8 and 8.05 I'll write that email, but I know that I've got particular patterns of work, deal with emails here, I've got my list of things that I need to follow up on, you know, and then I've got meetings and stuff in the diary. I'm pretty organised. I, and I do think the more complexity you've got in your life, the more you do need to be organised, if nothing else, to organise everyone else around you. We've come to the end of our, have, our time together. We? Yeah. Um, so thank you so much for such a rich and, and I think, inspirational conversation. Thank you so much, well, Jane. At least the good thing about being second is I'm only compared against one. You can give me <laughs> feedback in several more. <laughs> It'd be like that Top Gear thing, you know, what speed did you oh, go around yes, the track at? Yeah, or po well, perhaps not cancel that idea. <laughs> anyway, it's been a pleasure. I hope it's been helpful. Oh, absolutely. Yes. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Pleasure.